Helen Midlow Hall is an excellent person for us to bring because she has merged so many outstanding talents as a mother and grandmother, as a teacher, an associate professor of history at Rutgers, as a researcher, where she is the director of research for the Midlow Center, and as a writer, as a, a teacher, a lecturer, I am pleased to again have Dr. Hall come to us and to share with us her lecture, Blacks in New Orleans during the French colonial period. Dr. Hall. Thank you very much, Mrs. Borders. And first of all, I want to tell you how very happy I am to be here to share really exciting things that I've found. You know, one thing that we, we historians do is we, we serious historians, right? There's some historians who aren't always so serious. But we serious historians try to find out new things, look at things from a new point of view, try to find materials that are going to tell us something that, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you can't find out about that. That happened too long ago. Or they'll say, oh, you can't find out about that because that was about slaves, and slaves didn't leave any written records. Well, what I've discovered for Louisiana in the 18th century is that nobody could find anything because they couldn't read French or Spanish. And so I learned the languages, and I did a lot of research in France and in Spain and in Louisiana, and I found that 18th century Louisiana is the most richly documented collection of uh, information about people, about Africans and people of African descent anywhere in the world. And uh, so I get very enthused about what I find, and I guess sometimes as I go along researching, I bore people to death saying, oh, let me tell you what I found out. <laughs> and so now it's, I can say it's, I'm even happier because I've been able to put it down in a book, and it's been published, and so, uh, and I've been lecturing a little bit, and so I'm really happy to be able to communicate this new information to people and to have an interchange with them to get their reactions to it. And I hope that even though this is, we don't have a long period here, that anything that comes up in the course of my lecture, any ideas you have that you share them with me and with the rest of us. And if there is not enough time during the lecture, and any of you want to talk about anything afterwards, I'll be here and I'll be in the library for about an hour, and I'll be very, very happy to discuss any of this with any of you, okay? All right, now what, let me talk first of all about what I found for New, for New Orleans in particular, right? What was most surprising to me. Now, there were slaves in the 18th century, but these were the most uppity slaves you could ever imagine. You know? I mean, sometimes you couldn't tell who was the masters and who were the slaves, the way these slaves were carrying on. You know? And uh, I don't know if this is a tradition of this area or not. Sometimes I think that it, it is, and that's what I like so much about it, you know, because people just tend not to let themselves be put down. And I think that tradition has continued, that this is an area where people have a lot of self-respect and independence. And I think a lot of that comes from the 18th century and experience in the 18th century. I don't know too much about the 19th century yet. But certainly in the 18th century, the slaves that I've learned about, if they were really mistreated, they didn't hang around for mistreatment. They left. And a lot of them ran away. And they ran away in different directions. They ran away in different with by various means. And I'll first talk about some of the directions they went in, right? 
And I'm also going to read a few little poems here. They really come from Creole slave songs, and they were it, it, they are songs in the Creole, Louisiana Creole language, which was a language that was created by the Africans who were brought to Louisiana in the 18th century, okay? But I won't read you the Creole version. I'm not even sure I'd be pronouncing it right, but I'll read you the English version. Of, and first, I'll start with the real short one. It goes, General Florio, oh, General Florio, he was the, the uh, district attorney. He said, it's true they cannot catch me. There is a schooner out at sea. It's true they cannot catch me. Well, where were these slaves going in the schooner? There's the Gulf Stream that carries, that goes pretty easily from this area to Cuba. And so uh, there's a whole group of slaves who just got a hold of boats. One group of them united with some French soldiers and seized a boat and took off for Cuba and they ended up in Havana and they were living as free people in Havana and all of this is documented right that was one way they escaped another way they escaped was to go up by way of the Red River up the Mississippi then out by the Red River and cross over to what was then Spanish territory, past Natchitoches and into Adias, which was a Spanish military post. And that was another route of escape. But the most important route of escape was not very far away at all, right? And this is really unique to Louisiana. You see, there have been runaway slave, there were runaway slave communities throughout the Americas. Uh, I don't know how much you've heard about them. Anyone heard about the word maroon com maroons or maroon communities? I guess some people have, right? Okay, what this meant, what this word means was community of slaves who ran away and established their own independent communities. And Usually these communities were in remote areas, you know, like mountains that couldn't be reached and uh, way off into the interior where it was hard to get up and find them. And usually these, were, these runaway communities were established by recently arrived Africans. In Louisiana, the pattern was entirely different, and now this is what I'm finding. Whatever you expect to find based on what existed somewhere else, you don't find that in Louisiana. It's different, okay? In Louisiana, the maroon communities, the runaway slaves communities, were right in the area. And they surrounded the French settlements. This is the runaway communities were quite close. The slaves did not run far away at all. They stayed right on the edges of the plantations and they interacted day by day with the slaves who remained on the estates, right? They traded with the people who lived in the community, they went to New Orleans and they went to the markets and they exchanged goods and they traded. Now, why was it possible for these escaped slaves to stay so close? Well, first of all, the it's because of the way the land lies, right? It lies real low. And I think recently, when we had Hurricane Andrew coming this way, we got reminded that this place is really a swamp. And it's not too, even that secure in that, it, with, in the, the face of a big hurricane or a tidal wave, we could have had 20 or 30 feet of water in New Orleans, except for the old parts of the city. I'm happy I live in the old part of the city. I'm, I'm right at, <laughs> I'm at, right at, at Riverbend, which is the highest point in town, so I was being real triumphant that I didn't have any fancy house by the lakefront. 
But anyway, that's a little bit off the subject. The point is that in the 18th century, you, we, you didn't have these, these um, big levees along the rivers, and you didn't have ability to drain lands, and you couldn't build sea walls and levees and all that kind of stuff, right? So the city itself was just a little settlement right along the river. And not just the city, but you know, all the farms were little settlements right along the rivers, all the way up the Mississippi and the major bayous. And you walk back um, just a few hundred feet, and what did you find? You found cypress swamp, right? Or rushes, or whatever, right? Okay, well, these were the areas where the runaway slaves made themselves very much at home. And the, one of the most valuable products of Louisiana was cypress, right? So that the slaves were assigned to go work in cypress swamps. Well, the foremen or the masters weren't too happy to follow them into the swamps and supervise their labor. And for obvious reasons, they didn't like snakes and they didn't like alligators and they didn't like mosquitoes, right? This was not the most comfortable of work. So what happened was that the slaves from the various plantations, they'd be working back in the cypress swamp. Then they'd start building houses back there, you know? And they'd build them on poles. And then they began to realize, you know, this place is pretty good. I mean, we can live on fish and on shellfish and on, we can cram and we can catch crawfish. And then a little high ground here and there, we can grow a little rice and corn, right? And we can be self-sufficient, right? So why do we have to go back and labor and be mistreated? And so every plantation had what they called a passage behind it. And what these passages were, were little houses built by runaway slaves. And they met slaves from different plantations, met back in the swamp, and they started developing their own communities. Now, finally, this pattern became so important and so widespread that the runaway slave communities took over just about all of what's now St. Bernard Parish. Okay, now I've got, I have this, I have this little, this is part of St. Bernard history that you don't read about, you know. But, uh, you know, we talk about monuments. I wish that somebody would build a monument to the leader of the Maroon communities in St. Bernard Parish. He was a fantastic figure. His name was San Malo. And I write about him in a chapter in my book uh, and, but let me show you where the runaway slave communities were so strong and why they were so strong there. I guess this map you can't see too well, but I do have some giveaways. I have about 50 copies of the ma a map and some of the songs about running away. And so those of you who would like to see them can probably, you know, get them later. Uh, but let me explain to you why they, these runaway slave communities flourished in this part of the city, what is now the city, I should say, and St. Bernard. Okay, first of all, there's this settlement called English Turn now, right? That's a very fancy development, and it was always a place that was fortified in the 18th century because the, well, at that point, the river jogs towards the east. And there's a narrow passage between English Turn and Lake Bourne. Now, a lot of trade took place from the Gulf of Mexico into Lake Bourne and then through the Chef, through the Chef Pass or the Wrigley's and into Lake Pontchartrain, then up Bayou St. John to New Orleans, right? This was a very vital um, area for maritime trade. Now, it's true that some ships came up the Mississippi River, but they too had to pass right past English Turn. So that control of this part of the city was strategic, and if anybody who controlled this area con could control trade in and out of the city, and the main job of the city was a seaport. It's always been mainly a seaport, right? 
Okay. Now this area is full, was full of of uh, cypress swamps and rushes and reeds. If anybody wanted to come root out the slave community, the runaway slave communities, they'd have to wade through water up to their waist to get there. Even if they went in a little bitty boat like a pirogue, they could go in one at a time because the rushes were so thick. And so, and they didn't, the area was not mapped. Nobody knew anything about the area except, of course, the runaway slaves knew all about it, right? So they established themselves. If you, so if you look at this map, which you, you know, if you're, some of you are interested, you can see it later, right? There's a one on the eastern end of Lake Bourne, there's a bayou called Bayou Marron. And this means bayou of runaway slaves. That's what it literally means. Then below that a little bit, there's a bayou called Bayou San Malo. These are current names, right? Which nobody pays attention to what their, their meaning is. San Malo, as I said, was the leader of the runaway slaves. A very important man in the history of Louisiana, which nobody ever talks, who no one ever talks about. Okay, there's a bayou called Bayou Care Oba, which is now in St. Bernard Parish. And this was higher land. And this was along these, this land that they could grow crops. It was high enough so that they could grow corn and beans and, and various kinds of herbs, right? And so this community was largely self-sustaining. Now they needed to trade to get certain things like they needed uh, and arms and ammunition, not just to defend themselves, but also to hunt. So they survived to a great extent by hunting and fishing, but they also protected their territory. Uh, let me read you a um, Creole slave song about how the slaves survived in the cypress swamps. And this is also reproduced in the, in the giveaway, but I'm going to read it for you. It says, little ones without father, little ones without mother, what do you do to earn money? The river we cross for wild berries to search. We follow the bayou of fishing for perch, and that's how we earn, earn money. Palmetto we dig from the swamp's bristling stores and sell its stout roots for scrubbing the floors, and that's how we earn money. For making tea, we collect sassafras. For making ink, we collect pokeberries, and that's how we earn money. We go to the woods, tankos berries to fetch, and in our trap cages, the birds we catch, and that's how we earn money. At evening, we visit Mamzelle Maroto on St. Anne Street to gamble at Kino, and that's how we earn money. Okay, so we still have this old tradition of gambling there. Uh, okay, now these slaves were runaway slaves. They were the biggest slave owners were very unhappy about these communities. As you can imagine, first of all, they paid their good money for these slaves, and then they ran off, right? Not only could they not get the work out of them, but there were some very enterprising white colonists who figured out how to profit from the slaves' labor. Now, the, as I said, the lumber industry was very important in colonial Louisiana, and there were white lumber mill owners who would encourage runaway slaves to settle right behind their estates. And then the slaves would cut cypress logs and square them, bring them down to where they could be milled, and then the owner, the mill owners would pay them by the piece for each cypress log that they brought in, right? Okay, so this was another way that they made money. Now, the biggest slave owners 
as I said, were very unhappy about this, and so they tried to root out the slave, runaway slave communities any way they could. But believe me, they had a very hard time doing it. And in my book, I just talk in detail about their efforts to root the communities out and how the communities defended themselves and how they finally were able to capture San Malo, who was the main leader. But the capture of San Malo never didn't really end the community, the runaway slave community. They continued to exist throughout the colonial period. Okay, now the tradition of running away remained strong in Louisiana all the way up through the, up through the, to the and through the Civil War. I think you all know that when Union troops arrived, massive numbers of slaves left their plantations and joined the Union Army. And this happened more in Louisiana than any place else. But there's another Creole slave song that's, that, that uh, glorifies a slave named Moldurum. This is a 19th century song, right? And this is a very brief song, but it says, Moleron, hey, Moleron, it's not today I'm in the world. If you treat me well, I'll stay. If you treat me bad, I'll escape. And the story of Moleron was that he was a slave who had run away many times. He had, was recaptured many times, but no matter what, how many times he was captured, he always ran away. And this song was sung triumphantly during the Civil War as, a, as the slaves became confident that they'd be emancipated. They went out into the streets and sang this song. Now, a, lot, a number of times they recaptured runaway slaves and they would have interrogations of them. And they, uh, this was especially under the Spanish regime. And so they would ask them why did they run away. Well, first of all, most of these people ran away in families, and there are whole networks of families who ran away. So it would be the mother and the father and the, the, the daughter and the son-in-law and the grandchild, you know, the whole group of them would just take off together, or one, one would leave and the other would come back. And almost invariably they said they ran away because the master punished the wife. And some, one of them said, and he also threatened to punish me. This was the husband who was testifying. He, he says, we ran away because the master punished my wife. And punished by, I think they mean lashing, right? This was one of the main reasons they ran away. Okay, let me talk a little bit about San Malo, just to give you an idea of how extensive running away was and how important a leader he was. And I hope that he makes it to the pages of the books of, about the history of Louisiana. That hasn't happened yet. Uh, San Malo's name is very interesting. There's a concept in Bomb there's a concept in Bambara, which I think some of you know that the Bambara were the most important African nation in forming Louisiana Creole culture. Uh, but there's a concept of, in Bambara of the heroic leader. And it's the heroic leader who has the courage to defy society and to uh, defy the social order. And they describe the, the, uh, this leader as the person without shame. In other words, he's not ashamed to defy the social order. And Malo, the word Malo means shame in Bambara. And so what San Malo's mean, word name means literally in French is sans, it means without. Malo. And so in other words, he was without shame, meaning 
that he was not re that his actions were not restrained by pressures of family and friends and the social order that he had the courage to go out and innovate and defy the uh, social conventions and I think that that is what the, what his name meant literally so although almost all of these runaways were Creole slaves meaning that they had been born in Louisiana I think that San Malo's name is still referring back to this concept of the great rebel leader among the Bambara. He was so powerful that he was in constant touch with the slaves on the estates who supplied him with he, he supplied him and his group with arms and ammunition and information. Anytime an expedition was being planned again to root them out, usually San Malo knew all about it from slaves in the, who were all still on the estate. So that he had a wonderful espionage network to inform him what was going on. And they had regular relationships with plantation slaves. For example, in one, on one estate, the plantation slaves would drive cattle into the swamp and the maroons would kill, would kill the cattle and would butcher them and share the meat with the slaves, right? Something that they, they, they'd sell to get things that they needed. Uh, they, it wasn't just slaves that he was in close touch with. But the Spanish authorities say, you know, these, they, they pointed out that almost all of these runaways were Creoles of the province. In other words, they'd been born in Louisiana and they had extensive families, right? So they had family members all over the place, right? And not only did their families help them, but people were afraid to do anything against the Maroons because they were afraid that their large families would take, would get even with them if they harmed the Maroons in any way. So they, you know, they tried to organize free people of color, in other words, former slaves who had been freed, or people of African descent who had been born free, you know, and usually they had a militia of these people to do their dirty work. And they sent them out to chase the runaway slaves, and they could never get anywhere, right? And so the officials decided that the reason they weren't getting anywhere was because these people were afraid to harm the Maroons, and in fact, they traded with them regularly, and they supplied them with everything they needed. So that they finally decided that the only way to root them out was to send regular army troops against them. Of course, nobody wanted to go but they twisted enough arms to get people to go out and, 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 uh, and track them down. The, one thing I should point out is that these people, although the, the big slave owners who ran the government described them as thieves and brigands and murderers, this just simply was not true. These people were self-sufficient and productive people, aside from from bringing in cypress logs. They had crafts they built, you know, they made blankets, they made baskets and sifters. San Malo himself carved indigo making equipment out of cypress logs. Uh, they fished, they brought fish to the market in New Orleans. So they were really quite self-sufficient economically. And they did occasionally, when they were really desperate and cut off from supplies, they did occasionally raid plantations. But there's no record of them ever having killed anybody unless they were being pursued. So that people came into their territory to try to root them out, yes, they would defend themselves. And from what I can see, the only people they ever killed, they raided, right, was, they did raise some people who were trading along the Gulf Coast into Louisiana, but they were all English or Americans, and this was during the war, right? So this was a time when the colonial authorities were recruiting people, recruiting slaves to go out and kill English and Americans, right? So that this was not considered really murder, right? This was 
at least, you know, from their point of view, this was an extension of what they were asking them to do in the first place. But from what I can tell, they never killed any white Louisiana settlers whatsoever. Uh, but the uh, rulers, who were all big slave owners, denounced them as being thieves and brigands and claimed that they were involved in a plot to overthrow the government of the colony. And, you know, this was all just hogwash because they were part of the economy. They were part of the society. They just wanted their autonomy They didn't, and they were independent and live independently. Well, they did finally manage to capture San Malo. And again, there's a Creole slave song that talks about his execution and, and the way it was carried out. And again, I'm going to read you this last Creole slave song and try to save a little bit of time for discussion here. But this is the English translation again, and I have the original Louisiana Creole of all of these songs in the book for those who are interested in the linguistic background, right? Okay, this song goes, Alas, young men, come make lament for poor San Malo in distress. They chased, they hunted him with dogs. They fired a rifle at him. They dragged him from the cypress swamp. His arms they tied behind his back. They tied his hands in front of him. They tied him to a horse's tail. They dragged him into the town before those grand Cabildo men. The Cabildo was the ruling government body. They charged that he had made a plot to cut the throats of all the whites. They asked him who his comrades were. Poor San Malo said not a word. The judge his sentence read to him, and then they raised the gallows tree. They drew the horse, the cart moved off, and left San Malo hanging there. The sun was up an hour high. They left his body swinging there for carrion crows to feed upon. So this is a, a song that survived in St. Bernard Parish where San Malo operated mainly up until after the Civil War, and that's when it was recorded by a folklorist. So that this tradition went on, and a lot of the historical tradition of the community has been preserved and communicated in the form of songs and folk tales. And so if you want to know about the attitudes of these people, it's not so hard to find out if you look at the folklore, right? Okay, well, I'm afraid I may have talked a bit longer than I should have been. But let me say that this is just only one very small aspect of this long and complicated book. Some of it is more complicated than other parts of it. And, uh, but a lot of it is good just good stories. And I believe that uh, they have scheduled me to be in the library to sign copies. Be, I know everybody's getting ready to go up to lunch or class or something like that. Do we have at least time for a couple of comments or questions? Yes. Uh, uh. <clears throat> What I, what I would like to know, uh, you say it about the maroon societies. In Jamaica, they have maroon societies that still survive right. uh, until today. But I would like to find out what happened to those maroon societies that were living in St. Bernard Parish and Plaquemine at the time. That's a very good question, and I'd like to know. You know, once I gave a lecture and somebody came up to me and said, my family says that they are descended from a room somewhere in Louisiana, I think they I don't think it was New or near New Orleans, but somewhere in the southwest. And have you run into any documents about them? Well, I'm at a disadvantage because I'm just getting out of the 18th century and crawling into the early 19th century. But I wouldn't be surprised, you know, there's so many documents about Louisiana, especially in the in the parish courthouses. If somebody just 
does the research and looks, you know. Of course, one of the problem with St. Bernard is that the, fire, the courthouse burnt down, and so that there's practically no documents left there. And even for the colonial period, the only documents we found are those that were recorded in New Orleans. So I don't think that's knowable, unless there are families who still survive today and who have these traditions that they were descended from these Maroons. Okay. Uh, another question, if those families survived, they would have to have either... And those those families they would have to have either Spanish those Spanish those Sp those families would have to have either Spanish or French uh, surnames wouldn't they? No, not necessarily at all because you know there's a lot of people with English surnames but whose mothers had French or Spanish surnames. You know. Talking about the Maroons. Huh? The Maroons would have had English surnames. Maroons? Yeah. No, it's, it's probably a mixed picture, you know, like there's somebody, some people named Olivier, uh, who this means that their father descended from local people, but they may be named Smith or Jones, and their mother was named Olivier, you know, you understand what I'm saying? Right. So that a lot of people here with English names did have Creole, Louisiana Creole ancestors. Thank you. It was also, they also had a community closer, right? San Malo's li lived at, at Chef Mentor, that's where he lived. So if you want to put up a monument, that would be a good accessible place. Uh-huh. Uh, besides uh, way out in Chalmette, um, uh, from my understanding, uh, the community in Tremaine, right outside of the city walls, 
uh, was a similar type of uh, free slave community like this. And I wanted to know in your book, uh, do you address any other communities that are much closer into the city that were right outside the old city walls? Um, I think these communities developed later than my time period. See, I have, as I said, I haven't got, this book doesn't go, doesn't go past 1803. And I think Treme developed later. So that's for up to you folks here, you know? I mean, those of you who, want, who are interested in these topics, there's more documents out there than you can imagine. 